Okay, let's unpack this. For, well, for the better part of a decade, the entire conversation around blockchain has been about one thing. Mm -hmm. Technical scaling. Exactly. How fast can we go? How cheap can transactions be? You know, how decentralized can we possibly make it? Right. But our sources today, they're pointing to this this massive fundamental shift that's happening right now. The institutions are finally coming in. The institutions, the big banks, the credit unions, the fintech giants, they are stepping off the sidelines. And what they want isn't just speed. No, not at all. They're demanding security, identity, and I think most importantly, regulation first compliance. That's the whole story right there, isn't it? It really is. I mean, it's the difference between building a rocket ship that's incredibly fast but can't land anywhere safe. Right. And building a fully compliant airliner that can dock legally at any major financial hub in the world. The mission has completely changed. It's gone from just technological supremacy to uh, regulatory compliance and real world integration. So today we're diving into how Metallicus is tackling this this tension head on. Using Metal DAO and Metal L2. Exactly. To create what they're calling the world's first banking layer for Web3. Yeah. And this isn't just another chain. It's a whole new architecture, both regulatory and technical. And for you, the listener, really getting a handle on this architecture is crucial. It's about seeing where institutional capital is going to flow next. Mm -hmm. So we're going to map out exactly how their governance model, the Metal DAO, actually aligns decentralized decisions with the the very strict demands of regulators. And then we'll get into Metal L2. Yes, how Metal L2 solves that age-old problem of fiat on-ramps letting you do instant compliant transfers right onto Ethereum's scaling path. And finally, the Metal Dollar, XMD. The unifying asset. We'll analyze how it's designed to be that institution-ready bridge for both traditional and decentralized finance. To really get the scale of this pivot, you have to look back. Yeah. I mean, for years in the blockchain world, regulation was, it was seen as a bug. Not a feature. Think to work around. Exactly. Yeah. Speed, scale, decentralization. Those were the only metrics that mattered. But that entire mindset just collapses when you move from speculative retail trading to institutions. We're talking about billions, trillions of dollars in real assets. Precisely. And for that, institutions need KYC frameworks. They need identity control, secure settlement, and you know, verifiable fiat connectivity. But you can't just bolt those things on afterwards. You can't. They have to be engineered into the core design from day one. So that foundational difference is really the key takeaway from the sources. They are so explicit about this. Yeah. They say institutional adoption needs systems designed explicitly to be institution ready, regulation aligned and fiat connected. But building a railroad where the tracks themselves are audited and compliant. Right. Not just hoping the station at the end of the line is. Exactly. It means identity and compliance are the features, not the bug fixes you add later. Which is a much, much harder engineering problem than just chasing high TCS. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Because you're trying to serve two masters. Uh -huh. The immutable, transparent ledger and the often confidential uh, requirements of traditional finance. So let's look at that first master, decentralized governance. Mm -hmm. The sources all point to Metal DAO as the engine for decision making across the whole ecosystem. That's Metal L2, XPR Network, Metal X, all of it. All of it. The whole stack. And this is where that tension gets really interesting for me. How can a DAO, a decentralized entity, align itself so closely with banks and regulators who need, you know, clear accountability? And legal jurisdiction. That's yeah, the question. Yeah. And it's the right one to ask. The sources are clear that the Metal DAO is active. It's operational but it isn't performing the regulatory function itself. Okay, so what does it do? The corporate entity, Metallicus, handles the licensed banking services. The DAO's job is to dictate how the decentralized parts of the architecture interact and grow. So think of it like the corporation builds the compliant foundation. Yes, and the DAO is the architect deciding where the structural beams and the new floors go. That makes sense. So the DAO sets the community's financial strategy, which you need for a healthy ecosystem. Well, Metallicus makes sure the front door and the back door for fiat currency meet every global compliance standard. Can you give us a concrete example of this in action, this act of governance? Sure. A really powerful one that's cited is the DAO's role in managing the loan rewards structure. Okay. They actively govern the expansion of those rewards into key multi-chain markets. We're talking about assets like XXRP, XLTC, XBTC, XETH. The big ones. All the big ones. So this is the community deciding where liquidity should be prioritized. They're building out what the sources call institutional grade lending markets. 
So the community is shaping the incentives, which keeps the network decentralized, even while the corporate entity is handling the highly regulated stuff. Precisely. And it actually goes even deeper. The DAO also gets involved in wider industry governance. What do you mean? They're mentioned as being active participants in optimism, in OP stack governance. So they're not just staying in their own silo. That's interesting. It is. They're ensuring their core tech is aligned with the best practices of the entire Ethereum scaling ecosystem. So things like improving grant processes, metrics, quorum mechanics. Wow, so that's a fascinating layer of oversight. Mm. The DAO is kind of acting like a cross-chain standards body. In a way, yeah. Making sure that when an institution builds on Metal L2, they're not just getting local compliance, but they're also plugged into the evolving security of the whole industry's dominant L2 framework. It's very long-term thinking. It's a recognition that the future of this stuff, even banking-focused DeFi, it all depends on shared infrastructure and security. Right. By being involved in the governance of that underlying stack, they make sure Metal L2 stays current and robust. Okay, here's where it gets really interesting for me. Metal L2. Mm. If the DAO is the governance engine, Metal L tier is the compliant highway. It's an Ethereum layer 2 built on the OP stack. Which, for anyone unfamiliar, is basically the modular standardized framework from the Optimism team. It lets you build scalable, compatible chains that inherit Ethereum security. So building on the OP stack means Metal L2 gets fast settlement, low costs, and it's compatible with all the EVM tooling developers already use. All of that, yes. But that's not what makes it unique. The secret sauce is the direct integration with regulated fiat rails. And this is the piece that has frustrated the entire industry for years. Holy grail. How do you go from dollars in a bank account to compliant on-chain value without all the friction? They do it through a combination of the Metallicus Digital Banking Network, the TDBN, and Metal Pay Connect. Okay. Just think of these as fully licensed regulated plumbing. This infrastructure allows for direct bank to Ethereum transfers. We're talking instant fiat to Ethereum, instant fiat to Metal L2. And you said to any OP stack network. And importantly, instant fiat to any other OP stack network that Metal L2 connects with. Okay, wait, let's pause on that. We've seen other solutions, but they almost always involve an exchange or some unlicensed gateway. There's always friction. What's different here? The difference is the regulatory wrapper. It operates at the layer level. These aren't transfers handled by some third-party crypto exchange. Right. They are operating under Metallicus's own regulated frameworks, mm -hmm. which means full identity controls, comprehensive KYC, and instant reporting infrastructure. So the money coming onto Metal L2 is already clean. It's already been vetted. Exactly. It's compliant from the moment it hits the chain, which removes this huge liability burden for any institutional partner. That is just a monumental leap forward for developers. Huge. If you're an Ethereum builder, you don't have to worry about the messy, expensive business of vetting your users' money. You get access to real banking rails without the bottlenecks. You can just focus on the smart contract logic, knowing the money flow is secure from the very first byte. And from the institution side, Metal L2 becomes this essential settlement layer. A low-risk on-ramp. It's a regulated entry point into programmable money without forcing them to rip out their entire legacy tech stack. Because banks and credit unions are built on these core systems that are decades old. They can't just flip a switch to Web3. It doesn't work that way. So Metal L2 is kind of a compliant translator. That's a perfect way to put it. It's a bridge. It translates the outputs from those legacy core systems into the programmable, transparent rails of a compliant blockchain. And you get the benefits of the OP stack, the speed, the low cost with all the Metallicus innovation. The TDBN on-ramps, the identity controls, the DAO alignment. It all comes together to create a settlement network designed for real, serious financial movements. Not just for speculative token swaps, but for high-value activities that need a perfect audit trail. Okay, so let's talk about the asset that's designed to handle all of this. The metal dollar, or XMD. Mm -hmm. This is what's supposed to unify the TradFi and decentralized worlds. And it's much more than just a simple one-to-one back stablecoin. This part is really crucial for institutions. It's defined as a reserve-backed, risk-weighted stablecoin index. That risk-weighted part is the key institutional signal. Right. It's built on a reserve structure that is designed to be super secure, super transparent, and it mimics the kind of risk management that banks already understand. So it speaks their language. A bank sees XMD and it understands the capital adequacy behind it. It's not just another crypto token. Precisely. It gives them the comfort they need. And XMD plays this dual role across the whole architecture. Okay, what are the two roles? On Metal L2, it's going to be the main settlement unit. 
for DeFi, for trading pairs, for those institutional payment rails. And outside of the L2. On the XPR network, which provides that base layer identity and the WebAuth wallet, XMD powers the trading, the lending, the collateralization. So the goal is just seamless interoperability. Yes. Having this one unified risk-weighted asset means value can flow compliantly and without friction between a regulated bank, a DeFi app on Metal L2, and the broader ecosystem. That level of robust value transfer is just, it's table stakes for a real banking layer. Non-negotiable. This whole unified approach seems to point to that much larger vision you see in the source material, especially that Q2 2025 Metallicus report. Right. It's not just an L2, it's a whole compliance-first banking architecture. We should probably define some of those components. It's a full tech stack, and it's built for bankers, not just for crypto developers. It includes things like A-Chain and PulseVM. PulseVM sounds interesting. It is. It's described as a banking-optimized virtual machine which basically means it's built to handle the complex, secure, and often private transactions that regulated companies need. So what does that mean in practice? More control. More granular control. Specialized banking logic, and this is critical, the ability to manage specialized environments like private subnets. Which are also in the vision. Exactly. Because a traditional bank can't do all its business on a public, transparent ledger. You just can't. They need private permission spaces that are still anchored to the security of a blockchain. Okay, so a credit union could run its internal loan applications on a private subnet and then settle the final auditable transaction details on the public metal L2 rail so they get both privacy and compliance. You got it. And the vision also includes stablecoin issuance pilots running for those credit unions, showing them how to manage their own digital assets compliantly. So when you stack it all up, the identity, the fiat rails, the banking optimized VM, the private subnets. You get what the sources promise. End-to-end -end digital finance, from identity to fiat to blockchain settlement to DeFi, all governed by Metal DAO. It's the integrated stack that institutions actually need to make the jump. It is. Which brings us right back to where we started, that fundamental difference in approach. Most chains were built for anonymity, for speculation, for isolated ecosystems. This is the polar opposite. It is. The philosophy change is that Metallicus explicitly prioritized compliance first, identity first, banking first. Every single technical decision integrating PDBN, participating in OP stack governance, structuring XMD is risk-weighted. It was all done through a regulatory lens. And only after that foundation was solid did they layer on the speed and the DeFi. Right. So what does this all mean for the financial landscape that you, the listener, interact with every day? What does this new paradigm actually look like on the ground? It means the barriers just drop. Yeah. Dramatically. You start to see major banks and even regional credit unions issuing their own stable coins. Wow. Oh. You see regulated fintechs deploying complex financial products on chain almost instantly because they know the rails underneath are vetted. And for developers? For developers, the promise of DeFi becomes real for high value uses mm -hmm. because they finally have direct compliant fiat on ramps. Yeah. The whole definition of DeFi starts to shift from speculative to, well, to fundamentally regulated and transparent. The ultimate conclusion from the source material is the one that should really stick with you. Mm -hmm. The future of blockchain finance will not be decided by which chain is the fastest. No. It'll be decided by which chain successfully and compliantly integrates with the real legacy financial system, the one that secures trillions in actual economic value today. This compliance-first engineering, it's not a hurdle. It's the gateway. Yeah. This shift represents that critical moment where the tension between regulation and decentralization is being actively engineered into one single cohesive system. A secure, audited, legal on-ramp. Exactly. Yeah. For all that institutional capital that's been waiting on the sidelines. And as we close out this deep dive, here's a final thought for you to consider. Based on this idea of bridging legacy systems to programmable rails. Okay. If this architecture truly succeeds in giving banks that compliant path onto the chain, what immediate, complex, slow-moving legacy financial services? I'm thinking about things like mortgages, commercial loans, maybe even global payroll systems. All the slow, painful stuff. All the slow stuff. Which of those will be the very first to move entirely on chain? And how will that inevitable move fundamentally change the very definition of banking for the next generation? That's the real question. That is the real consequence of this compliance-first approach.